In this episode, I have the privilege of sitting down with returning guest Justin Peters to discuss three reasons why you should stop using Bethel and Hillsong music in your church. The three reasons are as follows. Number one, Bethel and Hillsong are not true churches. Number two, by using Bethel and Hillsong music, you're subjecting weaker members of your body to heresy. And number three, even the non-heretical songs by Bethel and Hillsong still are not theologically robust enough to combat the idolatry and heresy that already exist in our sinful hearts. Now, we recorded this in two parts, and so for this, part one, we're just going to tackle that first reason. Bethel and Hillsong are not true churches, and we're going to do this by explaining precisely why they're not true churches and providing a biblical criteria for what constitutes a true church according to God. Applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. All right, so I'm privileged to have, again, as a returning guest, uh, Justin Peters. Justin, would you go ahead and just introduce yourself to our listeners, tell them a little bit about yourself and your ministry. Yes, Joel, my name is Justin Peters, and uh, my wife, Kathy, and I live in Bozeman, Montana, and I am in full-time evangelism. I travel and preach and teach. And uh, I suppose that for which I'm most well known is my critique of the Word of Faith movement, New Apostolic Reformation, the Health and Wealth, Name and Claim it, Prosperity Gospel. I have a seminar entitled Clouds Without Water that is a biblical refutation of that movement. And uh, it, it's not my only interest. I, I am committed to expositional preaching, I teach on some other issues as well. Uh, I've written uh, one book thus, well, I've technically written two books, but only one of them is available in English. And and uh, the one that's available in English is entitled, Do Not Hinder Them, A Biblical Examination of Childhood Conversion. Um, mm. How to how to know when conversion has really taken place in the life of your child before you rush them off into the baptistry just right. because they've made intellectual assent to a few basic gospel facts. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so I deal with a number of other issues. I have a YouTube channel. I have a podcast. And so, yeah, uh, a lot of irons in the fire, I suppose you could say. Great. That's great. All right. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and hop into our topic. We're talking about um, why local churches should not use Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation music uh, in their worship services. And I know you and I would both probably go further than that and just encourage Christians to kind of chunk it all together, but especially on the Lord's Day when the saints gather together for our our worship. Um, We we want to be reverent. We want to be scriptural. uh, We want to do that which God prescribes in His Word um, as our ordinances of worship. And so that's the big thing that we're arguing in this particular episode of Theology Applied. uh, Local churches should not use Bethel and Hillsong um, for their their worship services on the Lord's Day. And so uh, we kind of are are outlining three reasons. And so the first reason that I know you and I both um, agree with We've talked a little bit about this offline, and I know you've done a lot on this subject uh, in the past, but we both agree that both Hillsong and uh, Bethel are not churches. And so could you speak to that for for a moment? Sure, Joel. Yeah, they're not. Uh, They certainly have church in their name, but they are not churches by the biblical definition of a church because both Bethel and Hillsong are, are cults, and a lot of people chafe when I say that, but I I stand by it. Uh, They do not have a biblical leadership structure. They they do not practice church discipline. The first command, actually, that Jesus gave to his church, Matthew chapter 18, Mm -hmm. they don't do that. And uh, they are both committed to word of faith theology, word faith slash new apostolic reformation, the very subject matter uh, for which I'm most well known, that which I teach against all over the world. Uh, the belief that it is always God's will to be healed. It is always God's will to be wealthy. Uh, you can have physical healing and monetary prosperity as long as you have enough faith. Uh, they they hold the word faith theology. Little God's doctrine, positive confession, speak things into existence, all, all of these things. And an argument could certainly be made that Bethel, pastored by Bill Johnson, is certainly more heretical from a purely doctrinal standpoint. I mean, they yeah. they are they are more heretical. Um, 
but they are they're cut from the same basic cloth. And in fact, when you look at Hillsong's conferences, uh, you see a lot of cross pollination between Hillsong, Brian Houston and Bethel, Bill Johnson. They speak at each other's conferences. They're very friendly with each other. They're simpatico. They endorse one another. And so, um, yeah, so, so they're, they're both They've- cults. Yeah, I totally agree. And in my observation, it seems like they both have the foundation, the foundational um, doctrinal tenets, false doctrines. Um, the real difference isn't doctrinal; it's more so like a, um, a philosophy of ministry. Hillsong is a little bit more of the seeker sensitive, lighthearted. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't want to scare you away. And then Bethel is a little right. bit more of the we'll talk about grave sucking, <laughs> you know, and yeah. and, uh, and right. we're you know we're going to scare a lot of you know sane people away. I imagine that Hillsong probably has more sane people among its membership that are just deceived, whereas. Um, Bethel attracts a lot of people, but but it really kind of a, um, a a type of person, you know, the the type of person who um, I'm sure there's many precious people there, but um, but the type of person who's you know just more comfortable with in your face kind of mystical, you know, you know things that a normal person would say that's that's pretty weird. So, but the, but my point is that I think they both have the the same a lot of the same doctrinal tenets. Um, but there's there's a, a a very noticeable difference in in their philosophy of ministry. Yeah. So what what are some of those doctrines? Um, if you were to boil them down to maybe just a handful, what are, what are some of the the big clear doctrinal heresies uh, that that Hillsong and or Bethel uh, would hold to and have publicly preached? Yeah, uh, there would be a number of them. Both of them would would be an anti lordship salvation. Uh, kind of message. They, uh, easy believism, mm-hmm. pray the sinner's prayer. You know, as long as you recite those words, you're in, you're in the club kind of thing. No emphasis at all on repentance or taking up the cross, denying yourself. And in fact, um, self-fulfillment and self-indulgence is kind of the, the hallmark of this movement. You know, come to Christ and Jesus will make you rich and Jesus will heal your body. They, they appeal to fallen human desires as the mm-hmm. basis their, for their movement. Um, uh, Bethel would certainly, as I said a minute ago, doctrinally get more into full-blown heresy. Hillsong you can kind of think of as kind of like the Joel Osteen-ish right. wing of this movement, you know, kind of the happy clappy kind of stuff. Uh, Bethel is that as well, but they get more into the heretical things. Like uh, one of the things that um, I have a video in my seminar that is just truly horrific. And it's a video that Bethel uses actually in their advertisement. It's not something that they're embarrassed by. They're actually proud of Mm -hmm. it, but it shows one of their staff members, a man named Seth Dahl, D-A-H-L. And he claims in this video, I wish we had it, we could play it, but he claims in this video that he had a vision of Jesus. And in this vision, Jesus embraced him, held him, like hugged him tightly and said to Seth, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I mean, think about that. The, the, the son of God, the thrice holy son of God saying to a wretched, vile, sinful creature, please forgive me. Yeah. And, and th- I mean, that, that is so blasphemous. Sometimes I feel like blasphemy is not even a strong enough word. I, mm. I, I kind of almost feel myself wanting something even, even stronger than that, but right. uh, it is utter and sheer blasphemy. And, mm. um, and they're proud of this. I mean, this is something they have used, put out in their advertising. So, I mean, any quote unquote church that would have such a profoundly low view of Christ as to actually advertise to the world that Jesus is asking any of us for forgiveness. Right. Gobsmacking, just yep. gobsmacking. And um, mm-hmm. so a very low Christology, they get into the, the uh, uh, in addition to their like grave sucking that you mentioned, uh, they have fire tunnels, they have the Bethel school of supernatural ministry that gets the, in Bethel, the Bethel school of wizardry and witchcraft. 
Yeah, it's uh, like a theological Hogwarts. Uh, <laughs> Hogwarts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a theology. It's kind of a Christianized version of um, what's right. his name? Uh, Harry yeah, Potter. Yeah, Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. There you go. I got you. Yeah. So, um, but they also have a, a very low view of Christ. Their Christology is very errant. Um, they get into the kenosis, the belief mm-hmm. that Jesus completely divested himself of deity while he right. was on earth. And, and uh, why, a, real quick, why do they do that, Justin? Because there's, you and I both know there's a really specific reason why they want to, if we could speak to their intentions, not just what they do, but why they do it, there's a really specific reason why they want this Jesus who has to ask for certain people's forgiveness, which absolutely is blasphemous, or this Jesus who uh, completely empties himself, divests himself, uh, uh, divest himself of his divinity, and this emphasis on the kenosis. What, what is their intent? What are they trying to accomplish by, by kind of getting, getting Jesus small, making him small? Yeah. Well, they, they make Jesus small because they want to make man big. And uh, they, they believe that if you are a Christian, then you, are, you stand on equal footing with Christ, that you have all the rights, all the privileges of Jesus. You can do greater works than these, which they totally take out of context. Uh, you, you're just like Jesus. You have all the authority. You have all the power that he did. Uh, and, and so, um, in fact, I don't have it in, in front of me, so I might not get this a hundred percent of direct quote, but, uh, but it's going to be real close if it's not. Bill Johnson has said that, uh, Jesus is the most normal Christian who ever lived. Hmm. The most normal Christian who ever lived. So, you know, if you're a Christian, Hey, you're just like Jesus. Right. All the rights, all the privileges. So, so they have to knock him down to um, elevate us to be on the on the same plane as he is. And specifically with the supernatural, with the gifts of the spirit, like Jesus, the most normal. So, so what they don't want to happen in in that ultra charismatic kind of you know word of faith movement, what they don't want to happen is they don't want you to look at Jesus and say, "Well, that's Jesus," <laughs> which you and I would say. Frequently, we would say, well, that's Jesus. Um, but they, that, that's what they don't want to happen. They don't want people, in their mind, they, w- they would be thinking, um, you know, if anyone who's saying, well, that was Jesus, is making, in their mind, an excuse. And so when they say the most normal life, uh, that, that's really intentional language Bill Johnson is using. He, so what he's saying is, rather than seeing Jesus as the God-man exception to all of humanity, uh, far and above, um, rather, we look at him as as the the norm normative, um, and and yet yes, it's true. Like we view Christ as the standard uh, in terms of his holiness, his doctrine, what he preached, what he taught, uh, what he did, how he lived. We we look at him as the standard, but there's a difference in saying Christ is the standard versus saying Christ is the norm. And when you say Christ is the norm, what you're ultimately trying to accomplish is uh, anybody who's not going around doing miracles a dozen times a day. Um, that's abnormal. That's abnormal, and uh, and so it's it's a way of of creating a culture where um, not only is the miraculous um, permissible or or uh, emphasized, but you're actually now ostracized and even demonized if you're not thinking about talking about and attempting whatever that looks like the miraculous on on a daily basis because that's been set as as the um not the standard of holiness but the standard of of what's normative and so anything outside and so it's a way of just kind of trying trying to you know say you know i I, i've heard bill johnson say before um he has a what does he call it Uh, i have a jesus theology or uh, a theology of jesus you know anything that how does he say that justin you know what i'm talking about uh, yeah, various iterations of that, but, uh, he, he, his basic error is that he believes that, uh, for example, when Jesus, uh, gave us the model prayer, our father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy, but thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Bill Johnson extrapolates from that, that, uh, on earth as it is in heaven, that whatever heaven is like, we should have here on mm-hmm. earth. And that's kind of like the foundation for his theology on healing, 
Uh, he says there, in fact, I have this in my seminar. He said, there's no cancer in heaven. There should be no cancer here on earth, even though his own wife has cancer. I don't know the oh, status wow. of it. He, she, yeah. Benny, Benny Johnson uh, had, was diagnosed with cancer several years ago. I don't know what the status of it is now. I mean, she's still alive. I know that, but, but um, anyway, he says there's no cancer on in heaven. There should be no cancer on earth. There's no sickness up in heaven. There should be no sickness on earth. And he says this as he's wearing eyeglasses. Right. You know, and I thought it's like, okay, there's no eyeglasses in heaven either, but yet you right. got a pair of them sitting on your nose right now. Not you, right. but I mean, you do, but, but, I, do. Yeah, I, do. but uh, right. I mean, so I mean, you see how quickly it breaks this, breaks down. Mm-hmm. So it's this over-realized eschatology. Yeah. Over-realized eschatology. They believe that everything that we are promised in the eschaton should be realized here and now. And that's mm-hmm. just not true. Um, mm-hmm. And I might also point out that there is no marriage in heaven either. You know, right? When right. when you get to heaven, you're not going to be married to your wife. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to be married to Kathy. Uh, and yet, he's married to Benny. Right. So, <laughs> you see how right. quickly it, he's it, not I mean, living in a, a very heavenly manner. You know, <laughs> so no, right. You're, you're right. It breaks it breaks down it breaks down very quickly, and yeah. it's and it's sad because you know it's you're right. It's an over realized eschatology, but it's also a truncated over-realized eschatology um, mm-hmm. because it's it's all focused so much of it is focused on physical health oh, uh, yeah. and and wealth but especially with bethel you know physical health where it's like man and in, in the new heavens and the new earth when, when we are there um th- there's there's a lot more going on besides just health yes we will be healthy yes we will be made physically whole we'll have glorified bodies uh that will never grow weary and die um but but there's a whole lot more. It's 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 uh, the increase of his kingdom. Uh, sh- there shall be no end. It's it's uh, the perfect rule and reign um, of of Christ. Uh, it's it's not just everyone's healthy. It's also uh, there's no Joe Biden. There's no abortion. There's no you know. There's a lot of other great things that that we could speak of with this you know with with the new heavens and the new earth. And and yet theirs is it's an over realized eschatology, but also a very truncated, narrow eschatology mm-hmm. that really only focuses on, on a couple elements and makes it as though it's the end all be all. So. Right. Right. They, the, the, the object of heaven, the object of our, they, they don't lift up Christ. In fact, we were just talking about how they demote Christ. So uh, I tell people often, you know, when I, when I think about heaven, what captures my heart, what captures my attention, what captures my affections, when I think about heaven is not being rid of my crutches, I think you can see one of them in the kind of in the background right there. Mm-hmm. Not being rid of my crutches, I don't. I don't even. I don't ever think about. Why? Well, yeah, I think I could just about say I don't ever think about that. I know it will be a reality, but it's not what what captures my thoughts. What captures my thoughts is that I will be in the presence of Christ, mm-hmm. knowing Him fully, being able to worship Him unencumbered by sin, um, mm-hmm. being in awe of his person for all of eternity. That, that is what I think about. Not, yeah. not streets of gold and, you know, supposed mansions, which is a unfortunate rendering in the King James, but that's another <laughs> subject matter, mm-hmm. you know, not, not that kind of stuff, not being a, have a, having heaven as a big family reunion or, you know, all these things. So, um, yeah, yep. I, I agree. Um, real quick, before we move on from this, because we'll, we'll get to the other two reasons, but the first reason you shouldn't use Bethel music, Hillsong music in your church is because it's coming out of, of two institutions that are not churches themselves. So if non-churches, according to biblical metrics for what constitutes a true church, are producing uh, the music, it just, I mean, that just really doesn't make sense. It's, but, I mean, these days we have evangelical churches doing secular music, you know, doing a, a song by U2. In, in their worship, you know, so I oh, guess yeah. at that point, then you, and all kinds of yeah, stuff. then you might as well throw in, you know, Bethel and Hillsong. But, but the, the point is, um, we, you know, these are, are two false churches. And with that, you know, you mentioned the kenosis and we've been talking about that, the idea of trying to normalize Jesus, his earthly ministry, so that, you know, this is what every Christian should expect. And really the emphasis, not so much being on his holiness, but more so being on his miracles, the miraculous. And every Christian should expect to be like Jesus because he's, he's not the, the, uh, the standard um, so much as he's the norm. And so the idea of the, you know, the kenosis, the emptying of Christ, they would get that from Philippians chapter 2. 
uh, verses 5 through 8 says, Have this mind, speaking about humility uh, in the church and honoring one another and loving one another. Um, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And they would really emphasize that. Uh, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, uh, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so I, I just want to mention that real quick for our listeners. The way that Justin and I would both um, exegete a text like that, that word grasped really is better rendered um, that, that the equality with God, that Jesus, God the Father, that Jesus um, did not... Uh, count as something that could be grasped, uh, that, that word is really, he did not cling to it. And so it's not this idea that Jesus was somehow inferior to the Father. He's uh, equally worthy of, of worship, equally divine, equally uh, glorious. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. He, very, very God, um, you know, uh, very man, very God. And, and so he's truly God. That equality with the Father, um, what, what the text is saying is it's not that he didn't have it and, and it was so far above him, he didn't even think he could reach it or grasp it. What it means is, no, he, he had equality with the Father and, and always has. Um, and because, precisely because he has real equality with the Father, he, he doesn't have this, he did not have a petty arrogance or, or um presumptuous attitude that he had to hold on to it, cling to it, and couldn't let it go. One of the ways you can tell uh, when a person has real authority and they're not just a a petty tyrant um, is they don't always have to um, boast about their title. They don't always have to boast of the, the authority that they have. And so Christ in humility, and that's the mind that we're called to have about us, not his miracles, but his mindset of, 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 of loving others, um, considering others as more significant than ourselves, Christ was willing to let go of that equality as it were. And we should add that phrase, as it were. And what it really meant was he did not divest himself of his deity. It says he emptied himself, but that's another word that can be confusing. Uh, What it means is that he concealed, his divinity was concealed by the flesh, by the human nature. So St. Augustine, he says that Christ is a divinity uh, wrapped in flesh. And so, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration, we see, we see the divinity of Christ and, you know, and Peter, James, and John um, saw it and were taken aback. Even at the arrest of Jesus, the gospel of John talks about twice that the soldiers, when Jesus just says, I am, you know, are you, are you Jesus of Nath? I am. And when Jesus utters the words, I am, they fall back and Jesus has to help them arrest him. <laughs> Otherwise they were never going to get it done. So Jesus very much had uh, maintained his divinity at, at every point um, and maintained it on earth, but it was often concealed uh, from, from being uh, perceived by, by the minds and hearts and eyes and ears of men, including the disciples. There are many, many moments where Jesus, you know, he even has to ask them, who do you think I am? Who does man say that I am? Who do you think I am? Peter gets it right, but only because the fathers revealed it to him because Jesus wasn't walking around on earth with a glowing light above his head, like some Jesus movies would kind of portray him. Um, But that's not because he lost his divinity or paused his divinity or laid it aside or emptied. Um, It's because his divinity was was, um, thoroughly concealed, present always, but concealed by flesh. But we know it was there because there are multiple occasions where where Jesus reminds his disciples and reminds us uh, through the witness of scripture that there's not a moment that he stopped being the fully uh, the uh, divine son of God. Would you agree with that, Justin? Anything you want to add to that? I do agree with that. And uh, no, I mean, you, you pretty much covered all the bases there. Um, okay. All right. I just want to make sure I didn't, yeah. didn't say anything that, you know, that you wouldn't agree with there. But uh, yeah, so that's, but that's the problem. When you, when you have a, a little Jesus um, theology that he, he divested himself of his divinity, he's not really God on earth. He somehow put that aside or paused it or emptied it. Um, and, and, and the whole idea is, and so now, you know, Jesus, so what, what's the power source? Well, it's only, and you'll hear this kind of, it's, it's Jesus is only doing things by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and the gospel never to speak of that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the power of the Spirit was present to heal the sick, or Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, or was led by the Spirit into the, into the wilderness. Um, but what they want to do is they want to basically make it seem like Jesus had no divinity in and of himself, 
And so he was only ever powered or empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. And wouldn't you know it, that's the same power that you and I have. So there's no excuse for us not to be doing the exact same things that Jesus did. And right, that's, and, and we would just say that's a horrible view of Jesus. And that's, and that's just bad theology proper. That's bad doctrine of God. That's a bad view of the Trinity. That's a bad view of uh, the hypostatic union of, of the divine nature and the human nature of Christ. It misunderstands the incarnation. It misunderstands um, the essence of God. Uh, that it's, it's, just, it's just bad, bad theology. And it's not just bad theology. It's, it is heretical theology. So anyway, what, what's a could you name maybe one other doctrine that we would say, yeah, this is a heretical doctrine that, that's coming out of these institutions? Well, uh, related to that is the little gods doctrine. They teach that mm. we are gods. Uh, Chris Valaton has taught that recently within the last couple of years. Um, little gods theology, of course, the kenosis, um, belief that we can speak things into existence, belief that we can perform greater works than Jesus did. Uh, and and also the I mean the, the false prophecies you know that in and of themselves marks them as outside of Orthodox Christianity because they all claim regularly that God speaks to them uh, mm -hmm. and they hear God speak to them constantly. God seems to speak to these folks more than He ever did to Moses, and they're always you know it is you you probably could barely listen to 10 minutes of a sermon out of Bethel and not hear the phrase, God told me, you know, right. I heard God say, God said this and God said that. I mean, it's just constant. It's just, it flows out of them. It uses out of their pores. And, and so mm -hmm. the charismatic movement really does not believe it to be a serious thing to put words in God's mouth that he did not say. Right. And, and yet the Bible marks such people as false prophets and they do this all the time, all the time. I mean, it's a, and you listen to their sermons. It's not about exegesis. You don't hear exposition of the text. You'll, you hear stories and personal mm -hmm. experiences. Well, God did right. this. God did that. You know, I saw this. This happened over here. And, and they'll throw in a verse here or two just to kind of sprinkle it in, to, you know, just to make it appear to be preaching. But that, there's no exposition there. There's no mm -hmm. um, inductive study of Scripture. Um, yep. It's all about stories, feelings, personal experiences, and false prophecies. And they do yep. that literally all the time. Yeah, you're right. Justin, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, brother. You're welcome. God bless you. In, any way that uh, our people can follow you, keep up with you? Yeah, uh, I have a website, justinpeters.org. And so they can find out more about me and my ministry uh, justinpeters.org. I have a YouTube channel. I'm pretty active on that, put videos out, you know, fairly regularly. And um, Justin Peters Ministries Facebook page as well. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you All so right. much. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch more content like this. Also, take a moment and give this video a like so that it can reach more people. And take a moment and click on the bell so that you'll be notified whenever we come out with new content. Thanks so much. God bless.